Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, as Charles said, I'm Pierre Gelpi from Semtech. Uh, in the marketing committee of the Alliance, I'm in charge of the group dealing with the logistics vertical. So, for the members here in the room, I welcome you also to contribute your use cases in this group. We are uh, really promoting the use cases of the Alliance members, so you are, you are welcome to, uh, to join us. I will do a, a very short introduction uh, about why LoRaWAN and logistics, uh, and then I will leave, uh, I will introduce the, the panelists very briefly, and uh, they will all make a five minute introduction. And now that the digestion is supposed to be finished at, at 3 p.m., uh, uh, then we'll have an interactive session between the room and the, and the panelists so that you uh, understand everything about their great use cases. So, um, why LoRaWAN is so unique for logistics? Uh, let me tell you about the real low-hanging fruit that I see in this space is really industrial asset tracking. Um, LoRaWAN is the most cost-effective cost infrastructure to have both indoor and outdoor coverage and geolocation for these industrial assets. Um, all the other LP1s uh, are more outdoor technologies. They really struggle to cover uh, indoor warehouses or factories. Uh, on the other hand, in this space, you have also indoor technologies uh, that we all know from the past, and they have very expensive infrastructure, uh, and they don't go outdoor. So LoRaWAN is really the, the only way with the flexibility of private and public networks to cover both, both for coverage and geolocation. So what, what does it allow? It allows, for instance, it allows, for instance, automated inventory. Uh, meaning that it removes all the manual intervention, all the manual operations, all the scanning that people do today, where there are mistakes, people don't have time, uh, sometimes they play with the system. Uh, anyway, it's really automated and it brings huge benefits to industrial players. I don't know if there are some in the room, but they can uh, testify if they want. Um, because in the industry, they are spending really millions on uh, replacement of, of lost assets. So uh, LoRaWAN is really unique. It, it costs maybe uh, 10, 20, 30K maximum to cover uh, a factory and have all the trackers, all the infrastructure, all the installation, all the maintenance. Uh, and um, uh, it's... it's, it's uh, uh, so to have all your factories covered, it's uh, uh, really uh, um, affordable, I would say, uh, uh, cost, and it brings uh, ROI in a few months. So, so these guys all get their return in a few months, and uh, I think that's a, that's a great learning that I discovered, and I, uh, I wanted to share with you just as an introduction. We have really low-hanging fruits in this space, and today we have uh, three more advanced stories. So I, I started with the easy one. I will let the more difficult ones to my colleagues here. Uh, they have solved more difficult challenges in, in, in their different uh, space. Uh, so we will start with uh, Gustavo from MaxTrack. It's in Brazil. They have, he will explain better than me, but they have a huge number of devices on a public network for car monitoring. They have solved the coverage challenge uh, because, of course, uh, in my story, it was factory, it's easy. But across the country, he will explain, it's, it's really a big challenge that he, they have solved. Uh, then we'll have Domenico from Axino. Uh, they are in the retail space. So again, my story was easy in the industry. He has been working, he's working in the retail space where the margins are lower, but still they are providing great value with food temperature solution. So I will let Domenico explain that. Uh, and then Alex uh, with a smart button for postal services. Uh, again, coverage topics, 
uh, the challenge of postal services today in all countries that we have. Um, he will explain what they have done there, but uh, it's also a, a great use case. So now I will leave the floor to Gustavo. Yeah, you can. You have slides, I think. Okay. Okay, so um, my voice is not that good today, but I think it's going to be enough. Uh, we are uh, basically a company dedicated to tracking, especially car tracking, and uh, we, we have about 10 years of existence, and we are leaders in Latin America for more than 10. Uh, actually, uh, we have a design house in Beijing that belongs to us. We have a logistics hub in Hong Kong, and we have factories in Brazil. And three years ago, we started uh, as a data company creating some kind of analytics platform uh, to provide value to insurance companies, which is the main persona of the business we have today. Uh, uh, these are numbers, just to start the explanation, showing how we are growing with Lora One devices. And I think it's uh, important to understand that uh, most of the variations you see of the oscillation uh, are because of a uh, shortage of stock, because we cannot calculate right now exactly uh, how to grow, but we are selling monthly about uh, 40 to 50,000 units of Lora One devices in Brazil so far. And we are being prepared right now to reach about 150K per month. So, uh, <clears throat> and how did we make this? Uh, in Brazil, we have about 70 million cars and trucks. So, it's a fleet that, that is uh, uh, traveling along the whole country, but concentrated on five big uh, metropolitan areas. Um, yeah, what we have in Brazil right now is 2G uh, covering very well the population, but uh, 2G is announced to phase out. So most of the big uh, customers we have, they are asking which is the next uh, big thing to replace uh, 2G. And, uh, Cost of 2G in Brazil is also higher than most of other countries. And uh, finally, we have American Tower setting up their LoRaWAN network. Uh, we have actually worked together for maybe almost two years now. And uh, Brazil is a huge country, so it's not easy for them to cover the whole country, but they have already hundreds, uh, reaching now thousands of gateways and uh, reaching about 90% uh, of the population by uh, end of this year, beginning of 2020. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. So uh, the big problem insurance companies have in Brazil is that about 1% of the, the uh, nationwide fleet uh, is stolen every year. So it's not only in Brazil. You have several emergent countries with similar problems. But in Brazil, uh, it, 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 it means that uh, from the 70 million uh, cars we have, we have almost uh, 700,000 every year being stolen. So this is the main issue for insurance companies right now when they try to mitigate the risk of their customer base. But uh, that said, insurance companies cover only 20% of the fleet. So we still have about maybe more than 50 million cars and trucks without any insurance because it's not mandatory in Brazil. It's different from other countries. So the, the addressable market is really huge. And even in, among insurance companies, they apply technology to only 5% of their customer base. So 5% times 20% means only 1% of the fleet has GPS tracking in Brazil right now. And uh, the reason is because the cost-benefit uh, relationship is not really good. So they must apply technology to the whole uh, customer base to just guarantee a better recovery uh, for a, a, a certain part of this. So uh, right now, um, 76% of the fleet in Brazil still have no technology at all. So the cars are just running. And the idea of the connected car is not, uh, let's say, so easy uh, in emergent countries like Brazil because people don't pay extras for, for uh, car accessories. So only the premium cars uh, come from factory with some kind of connected technology. Okay. <clears throat> well, so the next two slides are really, uh, uh, how to say, uh, an X-ray of what we did and, and what we are doing so far to, to grow with our project. So 
what we did to introduce LoRaWAN is uh, first use the shutdown possibility of 2G to make customers take the decision fast. An idea here was not to replace GSM, so we said use LoRaWAN as a companion technology together with GSM. And by doing this, we could enter everywhere. So uh, it was easy for companies to justify paying more for a second technology because they were mitigating a huge risk of losing all their assets if, if 2G was not available maybe two years later. Uh, second, uh, we created a kind of uh, uh, a workaround for the engineers because uh, they all would like to decide which is the best technology. So we said, okay, we can provide you all. So at the end, they all use only Lotter One right now. They don't use other technologies, but it was a good way to solve the dilemma. Um, we also had to create some workaround for coverage because uh, uh, despite the, the huge uh, uh, workload for American Tower and other partners, but uh, Brazil is quite big, so what we created is a network of uh, cars relaying information from all the cars until it reaches the, the lower one gateway. It was one of the things. Second thing, we created a kind of local network of devices inside one simple car, one single car, because the idea here is that the more devices I have and the more, uh, let's say, um, uh, hidden they are, better for recovery, so we created also some small network inside the car. And actually, we created also some kind of tools for professionals at the field being able to recover the car when it's lost, so we could not count 100% on coverage. So we created some kind of simple tools just to locate based on uh, warm and cold so they can get closer to the car and, and find it when they need it. Of course, it's applicable to any other asset, not only a car. So, uh, and uh, actually we had to change a way of, of doing a car recovery because uh, so far for GSM we were familiar to transfer a lot of raw data so that we could use the cloud solution and data analytics solution to decide whether it was the driver or not inside the car. This is, this is the number one feature we, we offer right now. Actually, we say it's the driver or it's not the driver. And this solves the issue of the insurance company to detect a car being stolen seconds or even milliseconds after uh, it, it, it begins. So. For LoRa, uh, we had to change it and we had to port some neural networks to the small devices. And so this is a kind of dilemma also because people normally think about LoRa as an expensive device, as an expensive sensors. But idea here is to solve the problem. So if I'm saving a lot of calls from GSM, I can steal a, a, a little more money for the device itself to be able to use LoRa one. And uh, Actually, we sell LoRa not as something cheaper, we sell as something better. And this is a lot different from most of the approaches that people use. So what we say to insurance companies is that it's your future protection, it's your jamming protection, it's your recovering rate just growing. So they see LoRa as a premium technology, not as a cheap technology, okay? So, and by doing this, we could enter the biggest insurance companies, the, bigger, the biggest uh, car tracking companies. Uh, so far, we are leaders in Brazil with more than 85% share of the market. Uh, we, before, of course, we were focusing car recovery, but right now what we do is uh, uh, behavior analysis for, for kind of precipitation uh, um, teams. Uh, we do collision detection, we do fraud detection, which is really important and it happens everywhere, not only in Brazil. So, um, well, and what we're doing uh, right now to address the growth of, of, of the, the opportunity is exactly to, uh, to scale the solution by trying to make it a de facto solution for all cars insured in Brazil or with a roadside uh, assistance package. Uh, we are talking about 20% of the fleet, so by the numbers we could reach uh, promoting Laura One, for example, uh, we could uh, prove that the benefits are a lot more than the cost of the solution. So actually, we have a kind of uh, uh, tricky equation right now that if we get the capex and the operation at the field, uh, we have green light to deploy to the whole fleet. So just with one insurance company, which is the second biggest one in Brazil, 
Uh, we have a green light right now for one million cars. Uh, the project has already started, but the problem is nobody has uh, people at the field to support more than 100,000 cars being installed every month. So we are growing as fast as we can. Right now, we have uh, 50K per month, but reaching fast the 150K. So the 50K we have right now plus 100 for this customer. And this customer only has 3 million cars in their customer base. So they said 1 million is the trial. If it works as it has worked so far, then you get all 3 million. So this is a very nice, uh, how to say, perspective because it's the point where technology is not the issue anymore. Operations are the issue. So the problem has just moved. Okay. Uh, Actually, since uh, more than 50 million cars in Brazil have no insurance at all, uh, we also had to try to tackle another strategy to get directly to end users. So we are creating a very disruptive commercial model right now where at the end we probably will give for free the technology to users. Okay, so this is a crazy model, but actually we are not alone. We have big, big people together to, to bet on that. So. And right now we are starting some business but for doing this. We want to show to people that have no protection, no roadside assistance at all, could have it. And uh, we, we only can do it by using LoRaWAN and by using technology. Otherwise, the risk for the service providers is too high. So what we are doing here is mitigating risk so that we can create a, 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 a value proposition for lower income classes which are risky from the insurance company uh, standpoint. And Actually, also, uh, we are creating some new topologies, let's say, for example, because we want now to go from cars and trucks to cargoes to boxes uh, to other moving things. So the idea is that we are using the trackers we, we install on trucks to work as lot of one multi-channel gateways. So the idea is that the truck itself will be able to scan all the inventory all the time. Uh, it's already going to the field right now. So the idea is that when we have these, we have also some kind of improvement of the coverage because you have some moving multi-channel gateways uh, that are distributed logically in a, the same way that the, the cars are. So uh, like the buses, the trucks, so we can cover what we need to cover. And finally, we had to create some kind of uh, last mile gateway uh, because when we uh, started to manufacture very low cost devices using LoRaWAN, uh, we had some uh, problems to mitigate, like, like for example, the firmware updates, some other information, some data logging we want to transfer, and LoRa was not really conceived for that. So the idea is that since every car, every truck, every bus, uh, at some point returns to some garage or some gas station or whatever, the idea is that we can create some kind of uh, short range communication with Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth and so on, so that we can do the other stuff we need to do. So we are doing this right now. Idea is to use it also as a kind of, uh, let's say, indoor network, but at the end, uh, not only for LoRaWAN, but for, for some other uh, usages. So I think that's it. We have uh, questions so far, but uh, um, uh, the idea here is that we, uh, luckily, we, we are at some point where operations become the, the issue, the challenge. So probably uh, more and more people here will have the same kind of problem in the next year. So uh, we are all welcome to, to share, right? Okay, thank you. And you can show your... Okay. Yeah. You I, can show your, your tracker. I have and, uh, some devices here so that people <laughs> can see it if they want. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. I'm, I'm glad that uh, he had... Uh, five or 10 minutes voice yeah. uh, and yeah. keep some for the questions. I'm sure you have lots of questions, <laughs> but please keep them for after the introductions, otherwise the others will be frustrated. So, uh, no uh, Domenico, okay. uh, go ahead yeah. about Axino. Right. Okay. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Domenico Carapezza from uh, Axino Solutions. And um, I would like uh, to wrap up a little bit of uh, the time. So um, I will talk to you about uh, quality and safety uh, in fresh food retailing. Um, the, the company I'm coming from, uh, we have uh, more than 30 years of experience in software solutions, integrations, hardware development, firmware development, and, and stuff, even though the companies is now only three years old um, because we are uh, a management buyout from, from a division from a, a Swiss technology company. I think I will skip uh, uh, this slide um, we, um, because you can read about us in the internet so we can catch up a little bit in time. 
So quality in fresh food retailing. I think the best thing I can do is to show you a short video that we made with our main customer in that area. Uh, and I think it would, uh, will answer a lot of questions and, and maybe also many things that I would tell you now uh, uh, in, uh, in here. Food products in refrigerated cabinets and cold rooms must be kept at a certain temperature to optimize shelf life. With the help of Exino IoT Food Safety, these core temperatures can be digitally monitored and read out on a continuous basis. The sensor can be easily attached to the refrigerated shelving with a magnet, from where it transmits data to the service via wireless technology, as it requires very little power for data transfer and sensor operation, the unit is designed to last for around 10 years with standard batteries. Data can be accessed at all times via smartphone, tablet or computer, which means that quality assurance employees need not to be physically present. Innovative predictive algorithms developed especially for this application uses the temperature dynamics of extremely diverse groups of products to determine and evaluate the core temperature of the foods down to plus minus one Kelvin without the need of core thermometer. One unit, different uses. In supermarkets, refrigerated warehouses or during transport in refrigerated trucks, Axino IoT Food Safety is the perfect solution. So, you may have uh, recognized what uh, the difference is of our solution maybe to other temperature monitoring solutions. It is because we are really how do you say, predicting and calculating the core temperature of the food inside the fridge without even touching it, right? And that sounds uh, somehow like magic, and uh, I think it is somehow magic, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's uh, I think, a good combination of, of innovating research and innovative engineering that we brought together, together with, uh, how do you say, computer scientists and, uh, and, uh, and people that, uh, how do you say, uh, created uh, this, this combined solution, right? So why was, is the, what is the main problem that we, we solve here? It, it is the problem that um, for, for the quality in fresh food retail is really essential, right, for the business of the retailers and the grocery store. And um, the main reason why it is so important is because according to studies, um, uh, for example, from McKinsey, it is uh, uh, clear that, or it, it, it came out, that um, the, the quality of fresh food is the, the main driver for supermarkets um, regarding food traffic, or, or I say store traffic, regarding uh, basket size, and also um, regarding customer loyalty. So that means, uh, uh, in the end, uh, of the other side, that um, if you have a, a fresh food in your offerings and it has good quality, and it is always in good conditions, then you have higher revenue and also mainly higher uh, margins that you can gain. Because um, one of the interesting outcomes of, of this study was also that uh, for customers, for instance, uh, of one of, the, of the, our large retail uh, uh, customers, they, they found out that um, for many customers, uh, the fred, uh, fresh food uh, offering um, and not the price is uh, one of the main reasons um, why they would recommend, uh, how do you say, this uh, a retailer as their preferred uh, shopping uh, 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 spot, right? And so that means um, uh, with, uh, with this, you, you attract uh, your customers and you also, how do you say, retain them. And they uh, also shop more because they come into your shop they buy the fresh uh, 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 food, so the meat, uh, the, the fruits, vegetables, uh, dairies, and so on. And then also, th when they are there, they also buy all the other things they, they need for their, their daily, how do you say, uh, living, right? Okay. So you, you just saw in the video that um, uh, the problem that we solve is it is not enough today, and this is also a horror for quality managers in retail stores, right? They all, they, today they get the temperature, the air temperature of the fridge. But in many, many cases, um, they, this does not really reflect 
the status and the quality of the fresh food. Because in the fridges, there is a high fluctuation of temperatures. It can go up to seven and eight degrees of temperature difference. So that means if the fridge shows you it has four degrees in the air, in, in some places in the fridge, it can be also 10 degrees, right? So, and that is a bad condition for, for various products. And this is, these are things that we can really <coughs> identify with our uh, uh, sensor and also then uh, uh, bring the data into our intelligent algorithms um, uh, back end uh, so that we can then calculate the, the core temperature. And uh, the, the, uh, the models that we have, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, brought into uh, our cloud solution, they are different for different types of food uh, products. So that means there is a model for meat, there is a model for milk, a model for cheese. So we have, uh, how do you say, uh, analyzed in a research project uh, the various types of foods and have, how do you say, also implemented different types of models so that the data stream that comes from the sensors, which is close then to this food group, uh, can be processed in a, in a very good, uh, uh, precise way. We are reaching now actually a, uh, an accuracy of uh, plus minus one Celsius, right, in our prediction. And uh, for, uh, I think, one or two food groups we are all already reached because we have deployed it in, in, on large scale in, in, uh, in, in numerous uh, supermarkets. And our solution learns from, from every, uh, how do you say, single data set that comes in and, and gets even better. We are close to um, around about half, one, uh, half uh, Celsius uh, in difference, right? So. The solution that we built <coughs> came up from this problem that was described to us by our customers, quality management department, right? And uh, I think we, we took the road the other way around. So we, we, we heard about the problem and then uh, went uh, towards uh, in the chain uh, to the front. So what do we need to, to how do you say, solve these problems? And fi finally, we came up also with our own uh, uh, sensor development because we found out that we have some problems that we can only solve if we we put something on, in place that has some specific features right uh, in on board and so that was the the reason why we have our own sensor it, it is autonomous it can be placed in any kind of refrigerator um, it has all the nice things that Laura Wan uh, has uh, brings uh, on the table right <coughs> and we have uh, uh, this intelligent backend algorithms. Here are some, some benefits that uh, are brought to the customers. But to summarize it uh, very quickly, I think for the customers, the, the, the return of investment lies, first of all, in, in uh, reducing manual, how do you say, procedures. Because today they are writing uh, the, the temperatures uh, on a clipboard. Maybe you heard about it uh, in, a, in a speech before. And um, they often also have to make some, how do you say, uh, uh, um, uh, probe man uh, measurements with core temperature thermometers, which are also very time consuming, right? And so, which also cause that when you have done this measurement in order to control if everything is okay from the cooling side regarding the products, you have to throw that product away. So imagine if you have a, a store chain of, let's say, 5,000 uh, stores, and you do that uh, procedure two times a day or maybe three times a day with three products, right? Then over the, the course of a, of a year, you, you throw away half a million of products. So that's, that's really a huge waste uh, that, that we can also reduce. And additionally, we, we give quality management department a solution that, uh, how do you say, really boosts uh, the visibility of what they, they are, have, are used today. Today they are used to have one measurement and also one core te temperature, and now they get 1,500 data points uh, uh, of, for every type of food group every day because it measures every five minutes, um, uh, 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 24 by seven. So that uh, solution is, uh, is a really something that is really stunning in the industry. It's really changing because now the food tells you, not the fridge tells you, what, what is happening inside uh, with, the, with the food. The food tells you in which quality condition it is. So we take the, the food safety and food quality uh, monitoring on a next uh, level. And this uh, interesting story 
uh, was uh, uh, was awarded um, on uh, the Mobile World Congress uh, this year uh, in Barcelona, and we won the, the, the prestigious IoT Innovation World Cup uh, in the area of uh, lifestyle, transport, and retail. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Domenico. Now, uh, Alex, about the smart button, smart reader for Swiss, uh, for in, in Switzerland, about postal services. Thank you, Pierre. Um, my name is Alex Raimondi. I'm working for Miromico. Um, <clears throat> and we have developed together with the Swiss Post an, <clears throat> a new product um, to def redefine the services the Swiss Post is giving to their customers. The Swiss Post is not about, only about postal service. They have to move on. They have to find new ways to provide services. They already have many touching points with their customers. May they be visible or invisible. Um, and they have to um, reinvent themselves for, for the future of their services. The product we developed is specifically designed for their own domicile services, which is services they provide at the homes or the offices of their customers. It can be customers, a business B2C or B2B services. Um, one of the obvious is providing postal services like delivering parcels, delivering letters, also selling stamps or various products. Um, <clears throat> They also provide. Um, what can I see out here? They also provide cash services to their customers. They do um, services like reverse logistics, which means picking up products such as recycling, um, uh, recycling materials, bottles, or, the, or even I like higher products like mobile phone recycling. So if you have old mobile phones, you can have the Swiss Post collect them, destroy them in a secure way, and recycle them in a in a good way. They provide business-to-business -business, uh, supply logistics, for example, for uh, uh, hospitals to refill their uh, support, uh, their, their <coughs> supplies in, uh, in soap or other products. And they do order deliveries uh, together with partners, for example, food or um, other um, uh, customer products. The product that we developed is a <coughs> basically uh, an, an IoT button, very similar to Amazon Dash button, just a little bit more intelligent because you can more order more than just one product. There it's integrating a technology called optical identification. It's scanning a printed code, which is basically printed on a, on a piece of paper with a standard printer, and it can read more than 22.4 uh, million different codes. You you scan it, you use the device <clears throat> by just pointing the device to a code, push the button, and it's ordering the number with uh, confirmed messages, which in here will, of course, be unconfirmed because there is no Swisscom coverage. They couldn't make it that far at the moment. Um, based on that uh, uh, device which is used for postal services. They also create other applications to um, reinvent or op uh, optimize already half digitalized or existing process. One, for example, is a use case with Bayer. Um, it's about ordering of medicines in, a, in a doctor's offices. Currently, the process could be, digit could be used as a fully digital process, which would involve mobile phones or computers, but um, in the daily business showed, showed up that they just don't do it because it's in some way it's disrupting or interrupting their uh, way of work. So what, they, what it's, it's done, they write it on paper, fax it over, on the other side someone has to type it into a system. With a, with a pen like this, you could ease that um, ordering process and just point and click to do your orders. Same use case applies, for example, for cement factories where they also do this uh, old-fashioned uh, way of ordering through uh, fax devices. <clears throat> Other obvious use cases, of course, is like ordering food, ordering menus. Um, the great uh, opportunity with the stick is that you can pr uh, just print on paper, for, which is <laughs> very cost-effective, and redistribute your selection of goods to order in, on a regular basis, and the customer just uses the paper points the stick to the ordering field and press the button and push, uh, place the order. <clears throat> uh, 
other use cases um, which are targeted is the so-called silver economy. It's a, a the constantly growing community of older people, um, it's, which is a market in care of like uh, 7.3 um, billion dollars in uh, billion Swiss francs in Switzerland, growing up to more than 10 billion uh, Swiss francs in uh, the next 10 years. So, <clears throat> what is so interesting about older people? They don't want to. Uh, they want to stay at home as long as possible. They don't want to go to retirement homes because they want to be in their um, well-known environment. But they, of course, they need some services. They need help. They need support from the community. In older, uh, like in, in in a few centuries ago, the family stayed together as long as possible. Now older people tend to live alone, but they still. Uh, enjoy that and they want to have, they need support from other services and using a very simple device um, which would, for example, uh, refrain them from using mobile phones or computer which currently they just cannot manage or just don't like, they can order services and, for example, also just simple uh, things like social contact with someone coming by and just talk to them. Other markets for it are as well like service at home for uh, things, double income, no kids, so more like upper class earning people, concierge service for, for uh, ordering goods as well, um, hotels, uh, food delivery in a hotel, if you have to take up, pick up the phone just to order your pizza at two, two o'clock at, at night, it might be keep you from doing that, but if you have to push a button and order the pizza, it, it's, it's opening new ways for services. <clears throat> the market is uh, changing rapidly due to dig digitalization in, uh, in the past few years, so the Swiss Post needs and wants to adapt to all those new challenges and wants to provide services and also develop their services into, into, new, into new ways. What is the actual need of older people? So they, it's about logistics, it's about care at home, it's about food, it's mobility, it's having someone just dropping by for a talk. And um, all that kind of services could be um, ordered or um, at least initiated by using um, this uh, software, uh, this, this hardware device linked together with the postal services they provide. And of course, also to incorporate newer or parallel technology like mobile phones, like web applications, and also to provide the service to everyone, for example, for disabled people that cannot hear or see the, 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 uh, the buzzer and the, the LED in the device, they could, could use mobile apps, they could provide the same services over a phone. So we, with using that button and the, the Backend, the, the, the backend software development the Post has done for this project, we can incorporate all those services and technologies into one um, great solution to provide new ways of distribution products and also collect products from homes. We are happy to talk. I'm here with my colleague Andreas Hosang. Thomas Koch couldn't, li couldn't make it because of the bad weather yesterday and Myself, Alex Raimondi from Miromico, happy to talk to you if you have questions about the product. And of course, feel free to ask questions during the session now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alex. So uh, now we have time for questions. So this is with the refrigeration uh, use case. Okay. So what is the battery life that you're seeing on, on, on your specific device? With battery, five minutes upload. Yeah, we, we put in some standard batteries, as you have seen. You can easily, how do you say, also change them if they are <laughs> out of, uh, of life. Um, between seven and ten years. Okay. Yeah. And um, when, when you're looking at the analytics to the side, right, right like um, uh, temperature difference between the air versus the product, is that more empirical data collection that has led you to that 99% accuracy in the temperature? Not like, only. Okay. Not only. It, it's not the way that maybe you have seen from other solutions that you collect data, 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 and then you, you try to find patterns and mm -hmm. try to find some sort of, how do you say, uh, um, irregularities. Mm -hmm. It's not 
only, it's not the only truth, let's say, right? Okay. Um, there is also some, how do you say, scientific model uh, modeling behind uh, these, um, these uh, prediction algorithms, right? Okay. So we, we have analyzed the dynamics of, uh, how do you say, how the temperature changes in the different food groups and um, also depending where it is stored and so on. So there are uh, several uh, parameters uh, that we take into consideration. It's not that easy. It took us three and a half years of research. After two and a half, we had uh, our first, uh, let's say, um, uh, prototype. And then we launched it in, I think, six or seven uh, supermarkets. And then we started to gather additional data, right? Mass data, big data, if you want to say that and to refine and to, to prove our algorithms and to adjust them to the right, um, uh, with the right uh, parameters, right? Um, yeah. I have actually a question to Max Track. Um, we have a similar client actually in uh, South America where they need to track boats because they got stolen. Have you any experience on OpenSea with LoRaWAN? No, uh, actually we, we we are providers of tracking solutions for many years. So we received um, many different demands from different customers. But when we talk about LoRaWAN, we, we are uh, focusing insurance companies and cars because then we can, let's say, create a kind of uh, controllable environment, you know? <clears throat> the problem about boats is that, uh, actually, one of the problems uh, we know is that uh, some solutions, they rely on, on uh, satellites, uh, because if the boat goes far away. But if, if you provide only a solution for a boat being stolen, uh, I mean, to detect the boat being stolen, it could potentially be, be, be the same solution we use for cars, but we think that the addressable market is a lot uh, smaller in Brazil. So right now we are just focusing on the, on the small fleets because we are talking about dozens of millions. But potentially, yes, could be the same. If you don't want to track, in the overseas, just, just near the, how to say, the docks, right? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so there are another question for the room or from the room or otherwise, uh, uh, maybe you, you hadn't uh, finished uh, before, so. A second <laughs> question. <laughs> so this is more, uh, you know, extension of the use case that we've, we've seen too, which is a farm to folk kind of use case where you start logging yes. the, temperature right at the farm and then, you know, extend it to the grocery store and that way the customer knows where it came from and, you know, what the quality of the product was when, when, they, when they use it. Yeah. So have you, have you seen any pull for that kind of use cases where you start monitoring the temperature, say, right from the farm, um, going into the grocery store and all of that? Well, what I have seen is uh, many different solutions, right? Always, tra how do you say, uh, targeting uh, a certain uh, piece of the, of the route, right? So that, that's the, the situation today. I think that requires actually a, a solution that is really, um, how do you say, able to handle all these uh, different stakeholders and all that stuff. And I think there are some initiatives, I don't know where, if you are aware of that, um, for instance, IBM Food Trust, there is a solution that tries to get all the stakeholders on one platform, right? And uh, also get all the data. It's a, it's a solution based on the blockchain technology, right? So we heard a little bit about blockchain, I think, today. So that it tries also, how do you say, to, um, uh, uh, to, to bring these stakeholders together even though they are maybe our competitors or have the same suppliers or something like that, so that it's, it, gets in a, it gets an environment where, where everybody can trust each other and everybody gets, gives the data that he wants to give to, right? This is also an additional, uh, how do you say, problem that you may have in different areas of, of the world, right? Giving the, the, the data, uh, because it can also, how do you say, if you say, okay, the chicken has, been, has grown up here, right? And then um, it has been slaughtered there. And then it uh, was passed into that uh, cool, cold store. And then from there, it went into the retail store. So if you want to really, how do you say, have the full information about everything, then maybe the, the farmer doesn't want to get or give you his name, right? 
and that can also be complicated in, in, uh, in uh, regards of data privacy and all that stuff. But that, I think these are, these are problems that have to be uh, solved somehow. At the end of the day, you, have, uh, you are right, we have the one piece of the cake that is really, how do you say, a large gray zone today and a large problem for, for, uh, uh, um, for not only for the quality managers at retailers, but also for the food inspectors. Because they, as you, you have seen, the, the main, how to say, um, the most important parameter for food quality and safety is the core temperature of the fresh food, right? So, and all the inspectors, they look, uh, uh, let's say, in, in a very, uh, how to say, accurate way on, on the recorded uh, measurements that you have done on the core temperature. The, the written air temperatures of the coolers are really not important. You do it once a, time, uh, a day or twice a day. What does it tell you? Nothing, right? So, but the core temperature measurement tell you, aha, you have measured the milk was uh, 5.3. So this is, uh, is not correct. So it, it's out of range. So show me what have you done in order to, to solve that situation. And this is something that we also provide a model, module few, um, uh, in our uh, system that really, if there is a deviation, you get an alarm. And if you get an alarm, you have also to, how to say, specify what, what was the action you have t uh, taken, right? So that at the end of the day, you are on a press of the button. You can uh, immediately report everything that the inspection needs to, to know from you uh, in any case that, that happened, right? And that is also a big advantage. And we, we got really very good feedback from, from uh, food authorities on our system. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry. I think we have to move with the program. So I want to thank our panelists okay, okay. very much. Thank you very much.